Hey guys, it's Trish from Mangtas. Don't miss great tech stories from our guests and our hosts, Jackie Nimink and Wato Delbare. Only here at Mangtas Nation. Welcome to Mangtas Nation Season 2. This season is all about tech of the future. We'll be sharing real-world experiences and featuring astounding guests to help guide you in your tech journey. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Hello, everyone. Today is another day of unearthing remarkable and inspiring tech stories from today's star of the show. And personally, I've been looking forward to this session as surely it's going to be an interesting one. So our guest for today is the CEO and co-founder of Carbon.fi, an ASEAN-focused blockchain solution firm aiming to establish a carbon zero world for the people and by the people. So without further ado, listeners, please help us welcome our guest for today, Bree Yek. Hi, Bree. How are you? Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Wouter. Hi, Jackie. It's a pleasure to be here today. <laughs> well, the pleasure is all ours. So, uh, well, let's just let's just start off by I'm sure um, we have a long uh, conversation to to go on a lot of topics, interesting topics to discuss. But let's start off by uh, mm. telling our listeners a bit about yourself, please, Bree. So, um, well, you've introduced me. My name is Bree. Uh, my passions are probably very very simple the environment of course considering what we do and i'm also very passionate about dogs um i come from a combined total of about 10 plus years in and working with environmental projects and also with a background in legal and also oil and gas trading so that's uh some somewhat of what informs what we do today at carbon five what we hope to do is to change the way that people actually work sustainability and help it integrate it into their lifestyles. Wow. Super, super exciting. And we'll, we'll jump into that a second, but let's take a step back, Brianna, and tell us a little bit more about how this all started, right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, where did you grow up and what made you so passionate about the environment to begin with? Tell us your story. <laughs> So I think in hindsight, um, what started off this journey was something that I think a lot of families can relate to. You probably watched your mother or your father coming back from buying groceries um, and then saving up some of the stuff that's left over after unboxing and unpackaging everything, right? So if you happen to have gone to buy groceries in a time where they gave you paper bags, your mom probably saved the paper bags to wrap around other things or to wrap other, uh, to you know reuse as packaging. Um, in my case, my mother would come back from shopping and have a lot of plastic, so she reused that to actually wrap my school textbooks and so on. Um, saved a lot of money, and I think that's kind of what led to me being very into like where can I scrimp and save, um, you know. Well, it's not necessarily just about recycling your plastic bottles. It's also about talking about things that you can do without consuming more than what's needed, right? So, for example, taking the bus instead of like, taking a car where you can, of course, um, trying not to buy more food that you can consume and end up throwing away stuff. That was all very much a part of, I think, in hindsight, um, where my interest in the environment came from. Um, and back in 2010, when I came back from college in the US, um, I started volunteering with a lot of environmental organizations just because, you know, I think that's kind of what um, the consciousness and the cultural awareness was from, um, you know, overseas as compared to, I would say, Southeast Asia, the idea of sustainability and recycling is very much more developed in other areas. So coming back, um, doing what I can as an individual was recycling at home, volunteering or beach cleanups, so on and so forth. And I think this was in parallel to my own career path, um, sort of like kind of took jobs because, you know, you need to pay the bills and like you're good at doing certain things. But after a while, you realize that that no longer fulfills you as a person. Um, you want to discover your purpose. For a lot of people, that could be baking. It could be 
becoming a surfer. It could be any one of those. Becoming a teacher is also one. So I think towards the end of my career experience, I sort of got a lot disillusioned with how I didn't really get to fulfill my sense of purpose because at the end of the day, the MNCs that I work for, while they were great, gave me a lot of experience and I'm always grateful for the people who actually brought me in, didn't actually make me feel like what I was doing had a real and direct impact on the community. So that sort of coincided with quitting that and trying to find my own way. I knew that it was going to be in sustainability because I felt very strongly about the environment. My dog is a rescue as well. So adopt on shop, guys, if possible. And um, so I think out of all that just came about the idea that I will try to start something of my own. So that's where it ended up being in 2019. Um, and I left my corporate background behind around mid that year and started on discovering where my true niche was, was in sustainability. So yeah, I didn't set out to become an entrepreneur. I didn't set out to start something. I think it's sort of more of a journey back into knowing yourself. And then when you get that, that part, then everything else falls in place, right? So right before the pandemic, by the sounds yeah. of it. Yes. How and was then, that like making that leap and then all of a sudden, wow, <laughs> things are changing rapidly. Uh, well, was that a blessing in disguise somehow, timing well, wise, or I would say so. About that? I think that was an interesting question, right? Because the COVID um, pandemic has thrown so many curveballs to so many people. It's disrupted work, it's made people behave very differently, brought out sides of themselves that, you know, might not have happened if the pandemic hadn't happened. I will say, and I like to look at things very positively, um, it gave me a lot of time and space to concentrate on finding where my niche was in the sustainability space because you have two years, well, in Singapore, where I'm based, and I am Singaporean as well, um, for almost a whole year, we couldn't really visit other people or be outside. <laughs> so it really gave you a lot of like clarity into focusing. And of course, because I have a dog, it's been great actually spending a lot of time in his aging years, like just to focus on work and then as a break, spend time with him. So yeah, it's been two years of focus. And I think speaking now as to what I know about having worked and run a startup for a few months, I would say since last August even, um, it's you need that clarity and that focus. Uh, we can relate to this. We are less than a year old. Uh... I'm personally not dog, but child, but 100% relate to yeah. everything you just mentioned. Oh, you have I something to look for dog. and something to take a break. So I think you find, you find your rhythm, I think, importantly. You have your purpose and your calling and what fulfills you as a person. But then that also is in conjunction with what are you working for, right? In your case, Walter, I guess, is your child. So but, that's but, nice. Yes. Very nice. And interestingly, Brie, like some entrepreneurs, they start up a, a, an, an organic shop or, you know, a, some something a with ecological <laughs> product. <laughs> okay. But why, why carbon.fi or why carbon.fi? Mm. It's interesting you brought that up because actually one of the first attempts at doing my own thing was getting a certificate in organic skincare formulation. Because my original idea was maybe we need to have a lot more transparency and truth and authenticity about where people source their stuff. Because people do care. Um, but at the same time, um, I realized that's not my calling. There were a lot of uh, players in that space already. And it's not something that I was truly passionate about at the end of the day. I think um, that led to a whole going back to square one and then exploring and because partially I come from the oil and gas sector and because I've been recycling for so long, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, let's look at the recycling stuff, right? And it was actually from the concept that I built in 2020 that Carbon Fi, the seed of Carbon Fi spun out from. Um, I actually was in a team where we actually built a hardware solution to clean plastic waste a little bit more efficiently so that they could then be put to a secondary use with higher output. Because of course, the cleaner the plastic, then the better you have some material to build, mix things with. Um, and I realized then it wasn't that people can't, or rather it's not that we don't have the science for it. It's just that there is no incentive to, because it costs a lot of money. Um, 
remember when solar panels came out, right? It was expensive to manufacture. They said that there would be cost savings, but there wasn't a necessary uh, push for it. There wasn't a necessary context for it to actually take on. Um, and so it's taken a while for solar panels to break even. Um, but similarly, we feel that there is a space for there to be an incentive framework to try to bring such initiatives um, faster to market. If you have the right incentive to adopt it, then the cost of these things will go down naturally. That's just how it works. And from there, um, I actually joined Ampler, and that's where I met one of my co-founders, um, whom you've spoken to as well, uh, Florian. So he actually comes from uh, one of the blockchain protocols um, that is very popular today. And it was a what we say in Chinese that I will try to translate is that it's a meeting of the right people, the right fates, the right time, I would say, that we came up with the idea that is behind Carbon 5, which is essentially an incentive framework to reward people for doing the right actions for the climate. Very interesting. I've, I've been through Antler. I know it very well. Ah, you have. Which batch, which batch are you in? So we were from the eighth batch of Enter Singapore. And funny story, I actually applied two times before that. Um, once with the organic materials idea and the second time um, with the hardware idea. And I think um, when I look back at it as well, while I was disappointed I didn't get in the first two times, I was also realizing that I got in where I'm supposed to get in because if I hadn't gotten on my third attempt, and I hadn't met Florian, then we wouldn't be where we are today. We wouldn't have carbon five. So it all it all it all pans out at the end, right? Mm. And 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 maybe a little bit. Uh, by the way, I love this whole idea of Handler where where they mix people up, match people, right? Of mm. of, of similar mindset and skill sets. But maybe to zoom into that. So so how do I? How am I incentivized using mm. your business? So. What we're trying to fix here is, for example, if you go and buy bubble tea, and this is something that I'm most familiar with because it's one of my addictions. Um, if you go and buy bubble tea, you usually get a plastic cup, right? And you pay a pretty cheap price. So obviously, there's a lot of factors that go into why the price of bubble tea in a plastic cup is so cheap. But if, I, if you decide to use a reusable cup, you probably pay something between $20 to $30 for it. Yes, you can reuse it many times, but the burden is still on you to pay more. And then, of course, you have to bring it to the shop, fill it up, you drink your tea, and then bring it back home to wash. So, of course, if I'm faced with that much inconvenience, why would I choose to do the better thing for the environment by buying a reusable cup? It's much more convenient for me to use a plastic cup. But if I were to choose to use the reusable cup and I could pay the same price as I normally would for bubble tea, or even better, get rewarded financially for doing it, of course, then I'll be more incentivized to do it. So that's what the framework uh, that we have is meant to accomplish at a very individual consumer level. Um, what we build it on is a concept in blockchain known as decentralized finance. And that framework naturally lends itself to rewarding the good actors and the bad actors. So we can delve a little bit more into the tech side later down the road. Yeah, no, no, but who pays? Who rewards me at the end of the day, right? The community shares um, the ultimate, rewards. The community shares the rewards. Uh, so if, if I'm financially, um, if, if basically I, I take this action with, with your example, right? And I use a reusable cup. Is it because people have put money in, bought tokens, and that's going back to me somehow? Or how does this work exactly? So the more that people participate in the economy, then the more that we're able to get returns on those investments. In a very real world sense, what we're doing is restructuring sustainable financing for such projects. Um, so things that, I mean, projects that are doing either recycling or uh, farms that are trapping carbon in soil, or even if, you know, some of the more visible projects today, plant trees, um, all these are now very centralized, I would say, you know, it's done by institutions and so on. What we have is a decentralized approach. So for example, the power of 10,000 people all contributing one cent will help that particular framework. And then we could redistribute that 10,000 one cents to a lot of projects. 
Thank you for that, Prem. Maybe taking a step step back we're already talking about uh, a lot of technical stuff but in a nutshell just for the benefit of our listeners as well what is the core mm-hmm. of what carbon phi does what 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 so, does actually carbon phi do so we have our solution is a multi-phase one so i'll explain a little bit about the overarching vision um the reason why a lot of projects today that do a lot of stuff that is good for the environment doesn't survive beyond the first or second year is because they're already very small, right? To ask them to try to monetize what they're doing, to go fundraise, to go jump through all the hoops of bureaucracy and red tape, um, and then to get financing is very tough for them. A lot of them run on volunteers, on donations, and that in itself is not very sustainable. So one portion of our solution is to actually make it easier for such projects to continue doing what they're already doing without adding any other work for them, but help them quantify what they're doing in a way that the real world or the world at large recognizes as a commodity. So in our case, that's carbon, right? We talk about, I think recently you've seen a lot of news about carbon offsets and carbon trading, and there are a lot of projects out there that could potentially qualify. But because they don't have the right knowledge, they don't have the right resources, fighting fires every day doesn't allow them to take a step back and strategize on these. Um, What our solution wants to come in is to fill that gap. So today, if you are, for example, one of our projects, if you're out there scooping plastic out of the ocean, and we all know that's a good thing, right? Um, I would like to be able to quantify if today you scooped out 1,000 kilos, how much carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases did you prevent from leaking out into the water, prevent it from leaking out into the air. And if you're doing good work, right, if you're doing work that impacts everybody and helps reduce health hazards and longevity issues for the world at large, shouldn't you be paid for it? So that's what our solution wants to do. They record their activities on there, and when we deploy it in Q3, they should be able to easily then record what they're doing and then be paid for it. So we want to lower those barriers to entry to those projects. Fascinating. And, and, and ultimately, this season for us is about tech of the future. And you already alluded to blockchain-driven uh, technology. So, so fill us in. Why blockchain? You already mentioned decentralized, right? But how did you decide on making this a blockchain-based solution? So I, re- I actually mentioned the decentralized thing because that actually is a separate concept from blockchain. Blockchain is a technology, right? I think we all know that. Decentralized means that a large body of people drive the momentum and they, I guess in today's terms, they virtue signal where the community should go to. Um, and then why blockchain complements that is because you want the community to have transparency and trust. And that's where blockchain comes in, right? Of course, we recognize that the data going on the blockchain needs to be impeccable. It needs to be verified. Um, But also having it out there in the open, make sure that the community has trust. Trust is a measure of how much honesty do you expect from the other party. And blockchain ensures that it's 100% honesty because everything is out there and transparent. You can go onto any of the platforms that track all these transactions, that track the data. You can check it. I, I love that answer, right? Because you're using it for the right reasons. Because a lot of people step into this space because it's hot, right? You could easily connect the community on a centralized tech type of technology, even small database or whatever. You could achieve the same. But if you truly did this for transparency, trust, and openness, you're using the tech exactly for the right reasons. And I really, really love that answer. Um, and and. And how far are, how far in are you now? So so uh, tell us a little bit more about traction, um, and and you know how how the the, the product is evolving. Are you MVP? Are you already beyond that? Mm. So we we are actually the first part of our solutions already live. Um, right now it's it operates as a very like I would say crypto centric uh, interface. Um, the first part of our community are crypto users because a lot of them. And projects, especially, and of course, protocols like Bitcoin face a lot of uh, backlash um, ever since last year with the environmental footprint that they leave, right? Um, So those are our first target audience. And that particular uh, interface already allows for people to, first of all, stick our native tokens so that they can earn the rewards by way of our native tokens. 
um, that native token gives the community, so the people who own the tokens, the ability to decide what sort of projects they would like for us to approach first to have on board our platform. And it also allows them going down the road when these projects have created their offsets to be able to buy and sell these offsets um, with discounts. So instead of paying like a normal fee, the more token holders you, uh, more tokens you hold, then the more steep your discount will be. And that is just to incentivize people to actually transact and purchase these offsets that will finance the offset projects. That's just really to nice. make sure that our listeners understand it, right? So, so could you maybe clarify exactly what you mean with a token? Mm. So think about it as uh, a share of a company. When you buy a share of the company, you believe in the vision of the company and you, uh, you want certain benefits associated with the shares of the company. So a token is like a share. When you buy a token, um, you are buying a say in how the company will become. And you're also uh, in a large part benefiting from the growth of the company. So that's what a token is. It's a share in that company and the vision. Gives you voting rights. And maybe, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and maybe to add to that, right, just like shares, people buy and sell, especially in the space of NFTs, blockchain, people uh, may come in for the wrong reasons to basically buy and sell. Um, is that impacting you in any way? Or, or do you actually feel that that's right? Uh, and the right behavior that you're looking for? Well, that's a good question. It's very interesting because um, we do know, of course, there are some coins out there like Sheepcoin and stuff that are very much built on speculative uh, behavior. Um, I won't say that we have none of those people. I think the community, as much as it is on blockchain, is anonymous. So there are, we can't control who buys and sells. But we do have a structure in place that the people who do buy the tokens who want us to see us achieve our long-term vision would hold that token for a long time. So there will be people that we attract and we have attracted some who simply want to do the same thing as what a lot of typical crypto projects do is to make it moon or to skyrocket their prices and then cash out on that benefit. Um, so yeah, I mean, the speculative behavior definitely does drive some of our attraction in terms of like the token space and the token price. Um, but in the long run, we know that the people who believe in our vision and once we actually finish with each milestone that we reach building out our multi-phase solution, well, we will see more and more people holding their tokens for the long-term returns and not the short-term gains. Fantastic. That's the, like any good investor, I would say, right? Um, basically I think there's some fantastic the investors, actually. Oh, love it. Uh, yeah, I may, I, may, I may buy myself some after this, Jackie. How about you? <laughs> yes. Uh, is it, is it accessible create a legacy to, to for everyone? Your children. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, is it accessible to everyone and anyone, or is it more restricted and, and highly curated at this stage? So currently, you can purchase uh, our token publicly. There's not an issue. I think going forward, um, as the third part of our solution includes people who don't hold crypto. We would like for them to also participate in this ecosystem because we don't want to limit the ability to benefit from this or to earn your rewards only to people who hold crypto. So people with cash and plain cash and who are not crypto natives um, will be able to participate down the road in Q3. So yes, you can purchase our token now publicly with crypto, but then down the road, you will also be able to purchase with cash. Phenomenal. I think that will make it much more accessible and much more mainstream, right? Mm. I think that the, the fact that crypto and the overhead that comes with that today um, may 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 not attract the right people all the time, I suppose. Mm. Uh, you mentioned something around milestones, um, and uh, this was more short term, but I th I'm very interested in your vision, mm. right? Blue sky thinking. Uh, Ten years from now, if everything goes right, where will you be? And where will the company be? Well, hopefully still leading this movement in one way or another. The thing is, with the vision, we, we want to, first of all, remove the barriers for these projects, um, enable everybody to benefit in these carbon markets, because everybody has a stake in it already, right? You live in this world, and whether you want to admit it or not, you will create a carbon footprint. So you should be able to do something about it. We, we're not going to force you, of course, we're just going to offer you an option. Um, and then the next step would be to create something that works for our region, because as I mentioned, 
um, there's a lot more visibility and development of environmental initiatives in certain parts of the world versus Southeast Asia. And so I think um, in terms of market opportunities, there's a lot in Southeast Asia, but we don't have the right things in place to support the growth. So we want to continue our vision by building something that will support the growth of these projects beyond a simple app that allows them to quantify what they're doing. Perhaps that might lie in working with other partners to create a new framework that helps them get to where they need to quantify their, their worth easier. Um, it could be potentially working with other partners to even develop our own projects uh, differently down the road. Maybe buy entire tracts of land to plant for us, because that would be an option as well. Um, so yeah, the world is pretty much right for possibilities. But yeah, I just know that I think for all of us founders in this team, um, that's the only thing we're passionate about. So <laughs> yeah, we want to be leading this movement somehow, seven to 10 years down the road. Beautiful. And I love how you say the world is bright for, for possibilities. And it is and I really wish, uh, wish Carbon Fi success and all the like. I'm just in awe about what you guys do. And uh, for, for businesses who maybe don't completely un understand cryptocurrency and like for people who don't know anything about it, how do you convince them to invest in, in Carbon Fire to buy tokens rather than, for example, sponsoring or, or donating to um, a charity group in, in Africa where you can save animals or uh, a charity group in Asia where you can send children to, to school? How do you convince them to, especially for, for, for those who don't really um, are not aware of uh, how great an impact you can make? So I think that's a good question because just to share, the reason why we have a multi-phase solution is essentially because we want to bridge that gap, right? And while my two co-founders are brilliant blockchain experts, I'm not. I don't come from a blockchain background. And when you look at your user base, you don't want to exclude the rest of the world, right? And the, the learning curve to crypto is actually pretty steep. So what our third phase of the solution aims to do is for normal businesses, which is actually our real, I would say our real world users to actually participate. To convince them, we have three options. Um, I will very simply take what you said. Today, he, they can actually donate money to an, a charity in Africa. Yes. I mean, I, you can also go out there to, let's say, the UN. And this is something that we do as a company. We buy our own offsets and we retire them to cover our own carbon footprint because, you know, we walk the talk. Um, you can do that. But whatever money that you spend doing that, it doesn't come back to you at all. Like you get a certificate, but since you're doing the right thing for the environment, shouldn't you make money off it or at least have some other tangible rewards? And that's what we, we want for small to medium sized businesses to do. We want them to be able to not worry about where are we going to find money that's not going to come back to us to satisfy these criteria that our bigger clients will require us in time to do. So today, for example, if you are a tier two, tier three company, so that's like a very small to mid-sized provider of services to something like a tier one company like Unilever or Coca-Cola, the entire supply chain is required to have a CSR component or an environmental, social and governance component. That's what ESG stands for. The typical process for, people, for companies to actually reach that compliance is to hire someone to come in and audit and that can take six months to a year to two years and for a small to mid-sized company that sort of time is not in their favor so we want to offer them this option where they can choose to uh, purchase offsets from our platform and at the same time earn from them and retire them or simply um, buy and hold our native token without actually touching the crypto side of it and so still participate in the ecosystem without losing money, they will always get money back. The idea is that if you're doing the right thing, you shouldn't be losing money for it. So that's the main uh, selling point for them. We take away the uh, uh, sourcing issues, I love we take it. away financing issues, yeah. I love it because uh, we are a small company. At the end of the day, we were early stage. We're not even a year old, right? And I can see us uh, partnering with somebody like you 
um, cause it's of its accessibility, of the return, of, of, of really just beyond just, hey, let's do something and get a certificate. I, I can if, if I'm presented two options, this sounds much more attractive to me, in all honesty. Um, and maybe my question, my follow-up question on that is, what is your target market like? Like, are we a, a marketplace like Mangtas or your, your target customer? So who are you going after now, at least initially for the next, let's say, one to three years? I mean, we would, of course, love for Mangtas to be part of the ecosystem once we launch the real-world solution. Um, I think what we... Imagine we don't want, and the thing about a democracy, everybody should be able to take part. So there is no limitations on who can enter, you know, and participate. Um, the first type of users that we probably will go after, and this is again uh, reflected in our round of investors. Um, I think the worst carbon per- polluter is probably fast fashion. So she and Forever Twenty One, so on and so forth. So what we kind of see is. Uh, on a very large scale, companies like that adopting our solution um, to purchase the offsets. And because they are created as a digital twin on board our platform, um, where it's open source, right? Everybody can see that they've done this action, that they've purchased these offsets. And then what they can do is to fractionalize those offsets among their users. So when you buy your, uh, I mean, not to enable consumption, but in order to already supplement what they're already doing, if you buy today a jean and a top, jeans or a top from one of these fast fashion companies, uh, the companies can decide to say, well, we've made these actions and purchased these offsets. So for the carbon footprint of these two items, we will also assign these offsets in a small fraction uh, to these items so that they are carbon neutral or at least they're carbon light. So that, you know, while you can still consume your products, you can still live life as per normal, at least you are doing something to mitigate the carbon footprint. So that's the first type of users we, we will likely have. And then free for all. Are you considering integrations, like embedding you into platforms like, for instance, ours, right? Where people purchase, buy and sell and have the option to incorporate that as part of that transaction? Is that Absolutely. something you're looking at or thinking about already? Um, we are looking at integrations. We, I think for the digital side of things, because that's where we're focused on, we're looking at potentially working with partners who already have digital marketplaces. So yes, why not? We, we want it always to be an option because I think at the end of the day, the, the idea behind Carbon Phi is that um, sustainability is not a one size fits all, right? So we want people to have it work their way and so if it means that for your users, having it as an option there uh, would help them with what you're doing, great, use that option. Why not? If they choose not to, that's also their choice. As I was saying, we want indeed, I agree that it should be available for, for all. And you know, we're all doing or trying hopefully to do our part in the environment. And with a company like CarbonFi, it would be great to be integrated in a lot of other platforms and businesses have an option to indeed support it. So we are uh, at carbon.fi. That is our website URL. That's C-A-R-B-0-N dot F-I. Um, the O being translated to a zero for carbon net zero. So once you're on the website, you can find all of our socials there across Twitter, Medium, Telegram, Discord. So please feel free to join us on our communities. That's where we post all of our updates on our project deployments. Um, And of course, with each phase that comes live, then you can participate. And of course, we look forward to everyone joining us in our community and helping us to get the whole world down to carbon net zero. Fantastic. And uh, well, that's all for today's episode. Thank you for listening. And thank you so much, Brie, for sharing your mission with us today, the Carbon Fi mission. And um, well, um, that's all for, for today's thank you very episode. Much. Once again, this is Jack Lindemann. Thank you. Um, once again, I'm Jack And I'm Walter Del Barre. And stay tuned for the next episode of Mangtas Nation. Thank you for tuning in to Mangtas Nation. Mangtas, your curated marketplace for B2B outsourcing solutions. Follow our social media pages to know more about us. Sign up as a client or sign up as a vendor and be a part of this global B2B marketplace. 
Join us at www.mangtas.com.